this is October 31st, 1974, in my apartment in Oklahoma City. Mary B. Roberts is your interviewer. Uh, this morning I have the pleasure of presenting to you a well-known person in Oklahoma City, connected with the history of both the state and the national interests of our country. Mrs. Clarence Roberts is going to tell us first about her own family and herself and uh, a few highlights about Beulah herself. We have another tape on Beulah. So we're going to ask this morning that uh, the majority of our time be given to that of her husband a well-known citizen of Oklahoma City who passed away in uh, 1942. But we feel that our tape collection would be incomplete without something on him. Who could give it any better than his helpmate and wife, Beulah? The next voice you hear will be that of Beulah Roberts as she gives us her name and place of her birth and anything she cares to tell us. She herself has been an outstanding citizen, helping on so many things and committees and so on. We're asking her to please not be too modest and to mention these in her rich life of experiences here. Uh, Beulah? I was born uh, at New Somerset, Ohio, in 1896. My father was William Monday, and uh, he came from uh, pioneer people from Indiana, and then down to Kansas, and then to Oklahoma. My mother came from a farm family and was born at La Plata, uh, Missouri. Her name was Frances Jeanette Hatfield. Oh, <laughs> uh, Francis, F-R-A-N-C-E-S, Jeanette, J-E-N-E-T-T-E, -E -T -T -E, Hatfield, H-A-T-F-I-E-L-D. You want me to back up? Uh -huh. My father was William, W-I-L-L-I-A-M, Monday, M-O-N-D-Y. The original spelling of Monday was in U-N-D-Y. Um, <laughs> a celebration at the uh, country schoolhouse, and uh, uh, my grandmother was visiting us at the time, and the uh, she had been placed in the buggy, and the horse started to run away, and uh, in the process, my grandmother's arm got broken. And uh, I remember when I left the uh, place, I presume I went back home with my grandmother, uh, looking through the open door where the light was shining out, and my mother was uh, robed in white, hanging on a cross. And the song, The Old Rugged Cross, was being sung. <laughs> that was one um, incident I remember. And another had to do uh, uh, when there was a terrible storm came up at night, and my mother and brother and I were there, and she decided to go about a quarter of a mile away to a neighbor's home who had a new cellar that had just been completed. Mm -hmm. And we were all down in the cellar uh, feeling very secure when someone noticed a centipede stretching out from the corner of the uh, of the cellar toward somebody sitting on a keg. And so that spoiled that occasion that we all went upstairs. Oh, and uh, where was this claim located? And uh, did you buy it? Was it uh, before the run or later? Well, I believe it was the last land opening about 1901 when my father drew a hat out of a uh, I mean, drew a number out of the hat at El Reno. And um, uh, so the claim, had, you had to live upon the claim for two years in order to prove it, as they say. 
Well, another little thing had to, another little incident had to do with a, a peddler approaching the uh, house, which was about a quarter of a mile from the main road, and he was uh, he had a wheelbarrow, and uh, my mother and the two children were there alone, and we were outside the the one room house at that time. And my mother drew up, went to the woodpile and brought an axe and laid it up against the side of the house just in case. <laughs> then another little th incident had to do with uh, my seeing a very tall, handsome man with golden curls hanging down to his shoulder, which was very unusual at that, at that time. It wouldn't be now. And uh, I thought that he was Jesus. <laughs> He turned out to be anything but that kind of a character. These are some of your early memories on the claim. Uh, was the claim at El Reno or near El Reno? No, the claim was about 10 miles uh, northeast, as I remember, from Walters, a small town mm -hmm. in Cotton County. Mm -hmm. And uh, it... Uh, my father established the first Christian church in this little town of Walters. Mm -hmm. Well, my, my father was a minister of the uh, Church of Christ, the Christian church. And um, I don't recall anything in particular about the incident, except I remember that he did organize the church there. Yeah, uh, from from uh, the claim, we went to Missouri where my father held a pastor at Ashgrove, Missouri for two years, and then to Kirksville, Missouri for two years. And uh, then we came back to Walters where we lived until I was about 13 years of age and attended the grade schools there. Then, then we moved to Oklahoma City where we lived for about a, one and a half years, and I attended the first year of Central High School after it was built. And uh, two of my friends were families that were very well known then and now. Uh, one was a Led Helen Ledbetter, and another was Margaret Archdeacon, who is now Mrs. Paul Darrell. And uh, then from uh, Oklahoma City, we moved to Stillwater, and uh, I entered as a sub-freshman. At that time, the... Uh, Oklahoma A&M College, as it was called, had a five-year course, mm -hmm. and the sub-freshmen and freshmen were supposed to take the place of high school, mm -hmm. and then the last three years were regular college years, mm -hmm. and I graduated with a B.S. degree in 1916 in home economics. Mm -hmm. Then uh, from there, I had a, a secured a job as a teacher in home economics at Hobart, Oklahoma, and would like to have have uh, taught longer, but my husband wanted to get married, so we were married in the summer of 17 and came to Oklahoma City, where I have lived ever since. All right, that's, uh, that's briefly giving, bringing us up to your uh, residency in Oklahoma City then. Uh, um, beginning with your um, community work here now. I know you've been invaluable in so many of the uh, associations and things that I too have been interested in. <coughs> and since our names are the same, both of us, Ms. Clarence Roberts, <coughs> I've always, <laughs> yes, sometimes we both came out on the same board, didn't we? And they had to call us Beulah and Mary. But it's been uh, a pleasure to have my name mixed up with yours occasionally, <laughs> and to my advantage, I'm sure. Um, I'd like now for you to begin on your community service here. Tell us something about that. Well, my early uh, married years were occupied mostly with PTA, church, and uh, Cap Alpha State Alumni Association, and uh, a book club to which I belong, the Aiken Book Club. But uh, uh, I had gone on the board of the YWCA uh, a year or two prior to my husband's death in 42. And uh, 
served two terms at that time in the YWCA. Then I had an overlapping of different activities, the Altrusa Club, the Legal Women Voters, the Planned Parenthood Association, and uh, sometimes went back for a second term. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I kept very busy for about the next 25 years. Beulah, well, I happen to know, you're not mentioning it, but I happen to know that you reached the National Committee in several of these. Would you please mind, you wouldn't mind mentioning those, would you? <laughs> well, the uh, Planned Parenthood Association, of course, I attended regional meetings and uh, knew some of the top staff people who visited us here. And uh, in the YWCA work, I eventually became uh, state member of the National Public Affairs Committee, uh, which uh, enabled me to visit all of the YWCA's in Oklahoma and to attend some meetings in New York City and Washington. And let's see, what was the other one? Yes, state member of the National mm -hmm. Committee. The, um, then with the, uh, the social side of my life had to do more with the Cap Alpha Theta Alumni Association, and I was uh, chairman of the Information Committee of the, of the Loan and Fellowship Fund. Most of these uh, groups, including the Theta group, had um, philanthropic uh, avenues that, uh, which made them worthwhile, even though the Theta group was a social group. Um, then uh, my last uh, activity has been more with church work, and uh, I was chairman of the, uh, I mean, I was a member of the Beautification Committee and of the Building Committee of Shepherd Manor mm -hmm. of the First Presbyterian Church, and for the last three years was uh, a member of the Nominating Committee of the Women's Association and served as chairman in 73. Um, that brings me up pretty much to the end of my <laughs> activity. <laughs> I don't think I'd quite say the end. I happen to know you're still a very useful and an often called on person. I've had great difficulty in getting this date with you because of your activities. So I'll have to correct that last statement, I guess. Um, I believe now we'll go to the life of your husband. Uh, could you give us his parents' names and uh, spell them out and uh, tell us where you met him and uh, something of his schooling or family or early days? And then we'll get to his work as the uh, great man that we knew him to be with the farmer stockman. All right, Beulah. Um, my husband, Clarence, was born in 1888 at Clarksville, Tennessee. He, he never used a mi middle initial, I think. I saw it in some place one time, and that's all, but okay. he never used a middle initial. Um, his, he came with his family when he was 10 years of age uh, to a, a farm near Lawton, Oklahoma. He helped his father on the farm, working almost as, like a man from the time he was about 10. And after he finished the grade school, he took an examination for a teacher certificate and taught in the country school. Yeah. And uh, he worked his way through... Where did he teach you? Well, in the country near his home, probably the same... Uh, near Lawton. Lawton. Mm -hmm. um, he, uh, he went to uh, Oklahoma A&M College and graduated in 1915, earning his way through, through college. And he graduated in agronomy and animal husbandry. What did he do? What did he do for his work? You mean in working his way through college? Yes. Yeah. Well, I don't remember exactly, but I think the young people, at, young men at that time, stoked furnaces swept out the halls and the room, school rooms, just anything that they could do, and maybe had to uh, 
uh, maybe clean out the stables, the, yeah. the agricultural people, uh -huh. anything of that sort. Mm -hmm. And I can remember him coming down the street one time carrying a pail of milk in his hand, <laughs> which I, I could see, see people coming down the street from where I lived, mm -hmm. which was quite close to the campus. Mm -hmm. um, in his, uh, as, a, as a student in college, he received many honors and was really quite active. He was on the debating team. Mm -hmm. and what uh, that Well, he graduated in 1915. So this must have been about uh, 13, 14. 13, 14, mm -hmm. 15. He uh, uh, was proficient in, in the English department and, and served as an assistant in grading papers. Mm -hmm. And uh, then he was the editor of the Orange and Black newspaper, the college newspaper. Um, do you remember any of the names of his professors or yours at, at those years back there? I, I would have to look that up, I think. One of the near neighbors uh, to my home was Dr. Bowers. He and his wife were friends with my family and, uh, and uh, were very good neighbors. But I would have to look up those names, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> Oh. Um, and in college also, he was captain of a division of the ROTC. Mm -hmm. they, it was divided up in divisions. And he received a sword, which they gave to the captains, which is still in the fam family, I think, somewhere. After graduating, he was a county agent in Garfield County for nine months. And he then went on the staff of the Oklahoma Farmer Stockman, of which Carl Williams was the editor. He became associate editor after a few years and uh, co-editor. Um, Bula, didn't he pick you up somewhere along the way? Haven't you met him yet? I think we're getting ahead of ourselves. <laughs> Where did he meet you in any of Uh, I met Clarence when I went to uh, a room on the campus where he was uh, where he, he was uh, in a class in order to give him a piece of news to put in the orange and black. And that was about in my uh, uh, junior year, I believe, in his senior year. And uh, our acquaintanceship and friendship picked up from there. Of course, he left the campus. Uh, you see, in 1915, and I continued on as a senior. Mm -hmm. We were engaged about a year and a half before we were married in 17. I think that perhaps it would be interesting here now to tell something about the uh, affiliation that he had with the newspaper and with his friend, Mr. Gaylord, and so on. Um, his his work at first consisted largely in uh, traveling all over the state in the horse and buggy, and uh, uh, there weren't cars in those earliest days. But after our marriage, he did in about the third year of our marriage acquire a little Ford coupe, and uh, of which we were quite proud. And we didn't own a car per for our family until. Uh, several years later when my daughter was about four well, years of age. Car. That was that was his car to use in uh, traveling around the mm -hmm. state. Um, he visited the ranchers and farmers. Yes, he visited the ranchers and farmers and uh, wrote up his stories about uh, different types of agricultural work. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they got the paper out, and it did come out about every two weeks at that time, it was a a, a task that lasted until about midnight. It was, a, and also their working days were very long. He was at work at eight o'clock and got home about six o'clock. So it was a long when working he was day. In town. Yes, when he was in town. Mm -hmm. um, his after the first year, his salary was increased ten dollars a week, which was quite welcome. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, as the years went by, he had different commendations from both Mr. Williams and uh, Mr. Gaylord, of which I have 
still have copies. Um, he uh, he became a very close friend of Mr. Gaylord's over the years, mm -hmm. and uh, of which he was very proud and, of course, appreciated his friendship. Mr. Uh, Carl Williams was invited to go to uh, Washington, D.C. on a, a, a federal program at that time. And so my husband became co-editor. At the end of six years, uh, uh, the farmer stopped him. Mm -hmm. Mr. Williams retired, and my husband was made the editor mm -hmm. in chief, for, and that was about 12 or 14 years before his death. Nobody so had quite a long experience as a top editor. Um, he, uh, I, I cannot be absolutely sure as to the date when the farmer stopped and was first uh, uh, developed, but uh, I, it was several years before, just a, a several years before my husband came on the paper, I think. Mr. Gaylord recognized the need of farmers in the state yeah. for information, and he was quite interested himself uh, in as much as he later on purchased a farm and developed a wonderful herd of Hereford cattle, I believe. But uh, so that it was a uh, uh, needed program in Oklahoma to have a, have a farm newspaper. And it eventually became the only farm newspaper in the state, with, with quite a large circulation, 240,000, as I remember. I know that the um, on some of my tapes that I, where I have interviewed ranchmen and farmers, they have mentioned the fact that that paper uh, helped to get them together because their problems were the same and it helped him to make decisions on uh, what to plant and how deep to plant it and what to do for certain pests and so on. Mm -hmm. Evidently, it was a very practical journal. The, the uh, editors of the paper also began to develop different programs which would be of help to the uh, farmer. And... Uh, uh, in 1930, uh, my husband organized the formation of a nonpartisan taxpayers association, and in 31, a nonpartisan non taxpayers association. And what was it? What did it do? Well, it had to do with uh, uh, it had to do with the formation of, of cooperation between the farmers and in securing. Lower taxes, as I remember. For mm -hmm. And ranching. Yes. You see, lots of ranch land was not celebrated. Uh-huh. And in 31, he worked toward the establishment of the National Livestock Credit Corporation for Oklahoma and the Livestock Marketing Association. And that became... And those organizations eventually uh, were, became quite large financially and saved the farmers a great deal of money. Uh, Clarence also wrote the book, The Business of Farmer, Farming, which was used in the public schools for seven years. He wrote that about 1926. And it also paid for a two-story brick home uh, about the time of the Depression, mm -hmm. which uh, was very fortunate. <laughs> and uh, is uh, that your home that, uh, that you were living in when I first knew you over well, northeast? 42nd or 47th, which was it? 42nd? 41 and uh, you owned uh, quite a bit of land there, did you not? Yes, it was a five acre home. And when we first we purchased it after having lived in the city proper for four years, and at that time it was out of the city limits, about a mile and a half north of the mm -hmm. capital and a couple of blocks east of Link what is now Lincoln Boulevard. Mm -hmm. And it was a dirt road except for about a quarter of a mile north of the capital at that time. Mm -hmm. We uh, we lived there for 34 years. Uh, I continued to live there 11 years after my husband died, uh, since we had a little son, uh, about 10 years of age at the time. And 
It might be of interest to uh, one little item that about a year before my husband died, he asked what would be the first thing I would do in, in the event that anything ha ever happened to him. And I said I'd put in a, a gas furnace instead of the coal furnace. So that enabled us to continue to live there for 11 years until my youngest son uh, graduated from OU in 54. The, uh, perhaps his best known work was with the, uh, the farmer stockman and with these various agencies which he, he himself helped organize and helped sponsor. Um, I know that the tributes that have been paid him from the Oklahoma Publishing Company employees have been almost extravagant in their praise for him. Um, I wonder if you could tell us something about, uh, well, let's say his early day friends and, and people that he visited or that uh, came to him for help and who worked with him and so on. Well, that's a little difficult to do outside of the Oklahoma Publishing Company itself, in as much as my interests, you know, were more there right in Oklahoma City. His his office was in the the uh, Oklahoma Publishing Company building on the third floor, had a, had a corner office there, and uh, he was a very close friend of Herbert Peck, who was a lawyer for the company, and also of. Uh, Richard Miller, the smoking room, who had the smoking room column. There were, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't remember a great many of uh, his close associates, but he did know, uh, of course, the business people of that time. And among his uh, civic uh, activities, he served as chairman of the uh, community fund, now our United Appeal program, and in the, among the people who helped him were Edgar Van Cleef and uh, uh, Mrs. William Casper Kite, who was Maud Vandell in, in college days, uh, also a classmate of his in the class of 15 at Oklahoma, Oklahoma State University. Um, I should be able to remember the names of a lot of other people, and uh, I think in some of this material I'm giving you, they, they are listed. I believe that's part of these. Um, we'd appreciate your giving us a little bit more on the interest of the community services that he served in. I noticed one article that you handed me here in which uh, the uh, United Fund uh, was presented with him as chairman and he has it headed toward painless giving. <laughs> um, tell us just a little bit more about, oh, some of the other things that he worked with and and the, what success did they have during those depression days on these? Well, in, look, in looking up some of this uh, material, I was agreeably surprised to learn that even though it was a depression year, they did make the quota that had been assigned, which I think was something like 300,000 plus. But uh, I had, as I had remembered it, they had not been able to make it, so I was very glad to <laughs> learn that they had. And, uh, uh, but it was a, a, a strenuous thing to pull the money out, I think, right at that time. Uh, some of his other activities were, had to do with his appointment as a pre to the President's Commission on Farm Tenancy. And he went to Washington frequently as a collabor collaborator uh, by AAA. Also the Drought Relief Commission and Resettlement Ad Administration in 34 and 35. Was that the national? Yes, that's the national program. And he became chairman of the Regional Farm Security Administration and he was appointed director of the Oklahoma City branch of the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City, serving four years. Um, Bureau, uh, you mentioned that that was during the Depression. Uh, how did he feel about this uh, 
killing off the animals in order to make a make it more more useful and more expensive for the ones that we did have left. We couldn't support the ones. Uh, he was on the national committee who made such provisions. Uh, do you remember what his attitude was toward that? I'm sorry that I don't really remember what his attitude was. I can only remember my own, which was <laughs> was uh, uh, you know a great disappointment and disapproval of such a program because it it seems to me that uh, some provision should be made for uh, the disposal of animals to the benefit of mankind. Whether I'm sorry I don't remember his attitude at the time. Um, after being appointed to the Federal Reserve Bank in Kansas City, I mean in um, Oklahoma City, he later was asked to go on the Kansas City Federal Reserve Bank and resign from the Oklahoma Post. Uh, have I mentioned that he was uh, on the board of directors of the Oklahoma chapter of the Red Cross in 3940, another local thing? And then he gave service to the First Presbyterian Church in the way of raising money for the church and publicity. Um, he gave the commencement address at the 14th summer commencement at OSU in July 35 when Dr. Henry Bennett was the president. Um, one of the uh, most interesting things that he had to do, personally I think, was that in 1941 he went on a tour of South America as one of 12 nationally prominent editors and scholars. The uh, tour was sponsored by the Carnegie uh, Endowment for International Peace and was a two-month trip. Mm -hmm. He enjoyed that very much. Mm -hmm. He was invited to, uh, uh, because of his interest in agriculture particularly, mm -hmm. to, to look at that aspect as they traveled around. Really, they covered all of South America making a tour of, of the whole country. And they were met by prominent people who also had uh, similar interests to the to the men who went on the trip. The men in general represented all phases of life, you might say, philosophy and finance and so forth. But as the trip progressed, my husband was uh, um, became in he was interested in the economics as well as the agriculture and became one of the authorities as a group of 12 along that line. And uh, he, uh, he brought back several mementos from the different countries, which I've treasured, you know, in the way of silver and so forth. Let's see. In uh, March 42, he was elected as former Stockman Counselor of the University of Oklahoma Research Institute. Other members included the Honorable Paul Walker of Washington, D.C., Mr. E. L. D. Gallier, Dallas and Washington, D.C., Mr. H. H. Champlin, Enid, Mr. E. K. Gaylord, Dr. W. B. Bazell, Norman, Mr. John Rogers, Tulsa, and uh, Mr. Lloyd Noble, Ardmore. He, uh, he also helped to organize the Oklahoma Farm Bureau. The first issue of the Oklahoma Farm Bureau Farmer Magazine in June 1949 was dedicated to him, and an oil portrait of him hangs in the director's mm -hmm. room, I believe. And who did that portrait? Uh, I, I don't know who did the portrait. Uh, in May uh, 2nd, 42, he received a commission as a member of the State Executive Committee of the War Savings Staff for Oklahoma. And uh, going back to 36, he purchased a ranch near Colgate, Oklahoma, together with Walter Harrison and Fred Jones, serving as manager for six years. Um, 
uh, our family never lived upon the uh, ranch. There was a, a small house that had been used by an Indian family there, and uh, the Harrison and uh, Jones families in particular went down quite frequently. We did take the two horses which we had on our five-acre home down there, and uh, on, on rare occasions we went down just for the day or for an overnight stay. One, one particular time, the Raymond Talbert, Mr. and Ms. Raymond Talbert, and uh, my, our young son and Clarence and I went down. And uh, just after we were having breakfast, a big rain came up. So we, and we were, had taken a trailer of the Talbert family in which we spent the night, a very small trailer. So we had to get out of there in a hurry in order to not get bogged down. <laughs> Um, I believe there was a liberty ship named for your husband, and I think perhaps uh, uh, you had something to do with the launching. Give us that story. Uh, this took place in uh, 1944. The 4-H club boys and girls in Oklahoma chose the, the name of Clarence Roberts uh, for one of the liberty ships. So uh, at the time, Mr. Ferdy Deering, editor of the, Far of the Farmer Stockland, and uh, representatives of the Extension Division at uh, Oklahoma State University, and uh, also representatives of the 4-H Club Boys and Girls, and my young son and I went down on the train to Houston. And when we got down there, the, the time set for the launching had to be postponed, it seems to me, about three days because of fog. But uh, uh, we had very close friends, the Warren Bellows family in Houston, mm -hmm. who helped uh, my son and I to spend the time, and so we had a very enjoyable time. Wasn't the launching quite exciting? Did you use real wine, or was Texas dry then? <laughs> well, I think it was real wine. I believe, uh, I believe that uh, that would be a requirement. <laughs> Um, we'd like to continue now with the other uh, community work of your husband. I don't believe we quite finished your notes on that. I interrupted with the story about the Liberty Ship because I was afraid we'd forget that. Uh, let's get back to the Farm Bureau. It has become such a, a tremendous uh, aid to farmers and ranchers in uh, Oklahoma and now as a national organization. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, the Farmer Stockman uh, Farm Bureau developed several programs of benefit to the farmers, uh, one of them being the uh, insurance program which had to do not only with insurance, I suppose, of crops and uh, yeah. uh, that, that sort of thing, but also of health and other benefits to the farmers. And I know that that is a, quite a part of the program. The, uh, being a part of the National Farm Bureau program, too, it has had a great deal of influence over the, right. the farm program in a national way. The Farmers Union, I believe, being the other organization. Uh, ooh, that was a big one. Mm. Uh, I see another item I have down here. That on May 2nd, 42, uh, Mr. Roberts received a commission as a member of the State Executive Committee of the War Savings Staff for Oklahoma. Now, was that... Uh, was that... Uh, before the ship was named for him or afterwards? Uh, that, would have been, that would have been before the ship was named mm -hmm. for him. Mm -hmm. So he was a, a member at that time then, mm -hmm. of the war savings? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was quite active in that. Well, <clears throat> um, 
It, it was one of the programs, of course, of, developed during the war period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He, uh, in looking over uh, materials that I have uh, in regards to uh, Clarence, I really have been surprised myself to recall how many different activities he had. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Uh, in addition to Mr. Roberts' um, his uh, professional work, he enjoyed music, the symphony concerts very much. Also, <laughs> plays. There isn't very, there is such a terrific uh, uh, lightning storm going on, Beulah, that I believe we'd better cut this off for a little bit. The lightning striking very close to us. And uh, I'm afraid of this machine for one thing, and I think we'd better postpone this for a few minutes. Mm -hmm. I believe the storm is letting up now, so we'll continue. But that was really a sharp one, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. um, I believe that uh, we were nearing the end of Mr. Roberts' work, Bula, was he ill very much during his lifetime as he worked, as hard as he worked, and as many things as he was in? How was his health? He, he was subject to uh, terrific headaches from time to time, which probably uh, uh, led him into having asthma, in his, particularly in the last year of his life. And uh, possibly uh, the accident of having broken uh, a piece of equipment on a trip to Kansas City uh, might have contributed to his last illness. Mm -hmm. But uh, he was in and out the hospital in his last year several times, going even going up to uh, the Mayo's one time. Mm -hmm. uh, however, in addition to his work, uh, I believe I started to say a while ago something about his interest. He he was uh, greatly interested in stage plays in, and in travel, and of course in the family. And he enjoyed very much a little small dinner bridge group of friends. Oh really? Who were who were in that bridge group? Well, some of them were the Herbert K. Leininger family, and Dr. John Payne, and the Warren Bellows, and um, the uh, Elliot Lyons. Yeah. And uh, let's see how many is there. There were six six couples. Four. Four. Who by who by oh the C C Ray Southwell was another family, and uh, he enjoyed them very much. I remember one time he took all of the men down to the ranch for a weekend trip, and I prepared all of the food for the trip, and they gave me a little present of uh, eight after dinner. Spoons, silver spoons to match our silverware. <laughs> oh. In the way of travel, I don't believe I've mentioned that, but we were very fortunate in uh, uh, in being able to go as representatives of the farmer Stocklands, the farm paper editors and their wives from all over the all over the United States mm -hmm. were invited to go to all over Western Canada on a beautiful tra trip on the train in 1925. And then the same group of people went uh, uh, out to California on a special train trip. And uh, then in 1930, we went all over eastern Canada. Mm -hmm. And those were very lovely trips to remember the because, lives. yes, the, the train service was beautiful in oh, Canada, yes. of course. Yes. Then the farmer stockman sponsored several trips for uh, farm people and others who might like to go from in Oklahoma. And uh, the first of those went to Cuba with a, on one of the fruit boats, uh, and mm -hmm. to Cuba, and then was to... Was that in the time of uh, Batista or uh, Castro? Well, I, oh, before Castro's time, I'm before sure. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we made a trip to Alaska, going on the inland passage up to Alaska, mm -hmm. and then we made a trip to Mexico City. And, of course, those trips involved uh, prior trips to make the arrangements, which my husband and I did. Yeah. 
And in the case of Mexico, a follow-up trip on which we took all of the children. And, uh, well, those trips, uh, uh, in, in, since my husband's death, I were followed up by a trip to Europe with uh, Florence Wilson on my part to, in 51, and then around the world with an old college friend, Nellie Evans of Norman, mm -hmm. in uh, 1960. Um, uh, the uh, my husband's uh, final illness um, caused his death on December fourth, nineteen forty-two, and uh, the funeral service took place at the Street and Vapor Funeral Home, and he was buried at Memorial Park. Mm -hmm. so, uh, uh, Bula, I believe that uh, your note said that there were four children. Uh, for the record and for the genealogists, uh, I wonder if you'd give us their names and oh, perhaps where they are and and uh, uh, something of their education and so on. Uh, we had uh, three, three sons and one daughter. The two older sons, Joseph and uh, Robert, graduated from... Uh, Oklahoma State University, about 1441, and uh, they each uh, went into Army service. The, uh, the oldest one became a, a captain in the Air Force and uh, uh, was stationed in Burma for one, one place. Mm -hmm. And the second uh, son, Robert, uh, was a second lieutenant, lieutenant in the Army and went all through the South Pacific mm -hmm. uh, War. Uh, effort. The um, youngest son, Donald, uh, who was 10 years younger than the next oldest, my daughter Betty Lou, uh, served three years in the Navy, and uh, he, he graduated from OU, then went to Washington University Medical School, and did his internship and his uh, residency at Colorado General Hospital. Mm -hmm. And um, now lives in Denver, is a, is a doctor there, uh, specializing in endocrinology. Mm -hmm. uh, my daughter, uh, Mrs. William A. Stubbs, lives in uh, Denver. She uh, went to OU until the middle of her junior year and was married then because of the, her, the fact that her husband was in service and uh, uh, was expected to go overseas, mm -hmm. which he did a, a year and a half after they were married. But he was overseas then for a period of time, and uh, their first child was born while he was overseas. Gula, uh, I believe that uh, your note said that there were four children. Uh, for the record and for the genealogists, uh, I wonder if you'd give us their names and oh, perhaps where they are and and uh, uh, something of their education and so on. Uh, we had uh, three, three sons and one daughter. The two older sons, Joseph and uh, Robert, graduated from... Uh, Oklahoma State University, about 1441, and uh, they each uh, went into Army service. The, uh, the oldest one became a, a captain in the Air Force and uh, uh, was stationed in Burma for one, one place. Mm -hmm. And the second uh, son, Robert, uh, was a second lieutenant, lieutenant in the Army and went all through the South Pacific mm -hmm. uh, War. Uh, effort. The um, youngest son, Donald, uh, who was 10 years younger than the next oldest, my daughter Betty Lou, uh, served three years in the Navy, and uh, he, he graduated from OU, then went to Washington University Medical School, and did his internship and his uh, residency at Colorado General Hospital. Mm -hmm. And... Um, now lives in Denver, is a, is a doctor there, uh, specializing in endocrinology. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, my daughter, uh, Mrs. William A. Stubbs, lives in uh, Denver. She uh, went to OU until the middle of her junior year and was married then because of the her, the fact that her husband was in service and uh, uh, was expected to go overseas, mm -hmm. which he did a, a year and a half after they were married. Mm -hmm. But he was overseas then for a period of time, and uh, their first child was born while he was overseas, and I was the only person present for that yeah. birth. You <laughs> were the grandma. My daughter is, has, uh, they and her husband have five children. Um, they have uh, uh, two daughters and three sons. My son, uh, Joseph, lives in California, Menlo Park, California, and is in the insurance business, mm -hmm. and has uh, three sons and one daughter. The uh, second son, Robert M., and his wife live in Dallas, and he's with the Procter & Gamble Company. We're missing. <laughs> um, Beulah, I feel like we're missing a lot of good stories and so on, but uh, if uh, you feel that this about covers it, why, we'll sign off. I thank you very much for this interview. We have one tape on Beulah, as I t said, but uh, we did feel that we wanted to know more about Mr. Roberts. He had been such a valuable person in this state and uh, and nationally that we felt that we wanted your story about him since you're the person that knew him the best thank you so much beulah and this is mary b roberts signing off in her apartment october 31st 1974.